helps them to sense pressure in the water and um, be able to keep from bumping into things. And it can also help them sense um, when prey or predators are moving near to them. And um, even with, it's kind of like a, a way of hearing in the water because it can help them sense those things. So um, we wanted to make sure we talked to you guys about that. And then also scales because scales are all actually pretty unique depending on which species of fish we're talking about. So um, the first, the first two on, um, it's my left, so where you see that picture of the shark and the gar, um, these are some of the more primitive scale types. So placoid scales are associated with like sharks, and this is kind of the oldest type of scale that there is. And they've kind of got like spines and they're all directed towards the back of the fish, so they really help with movement through water. Um, and then ganoid scales are a diamond shape, and they, um, they are kind of like a tougher material and things like gar have, have those type of scales. And then you take a look at cycloid scales over on the right. Um, these start to move towards more advanced types of scales, which doesn't necessarily mean they're better. It just means they're more recently developed on fish. Um, so the cycloid scales can be found on things like trout and minnows and um, they are kind of circular and they, they have actually growth rings on them. So they can kind of tell you how old a fish is. And then similar with that is the tenoid scales um, on things like the bluegill that you see below and all the different kinds of sunfishes have those. Um, and they actually have a comb-like structure on the back edge of, of each of those scales. And that helps the fish move faster through the water and potentially escape predators better, but then they're not necessarily as well protected like some of those, um, you know, tougher scale types. So um, the placoid and the ganoid scales, uh, sorry, the, the placoid scales, they will actually add more as they grow, but then pretty much for the rest of them, those scales grow in size as the fish grows. So, um, and then another thing to keep in mind is just that there are um, slime coatings over these fish and they help to protect from any kinds of fung fungi or parasites that could end up living on the fish. So um, if you've ever touched a fish before, they can be pretty slimy, um, which is kind of cool, but, and then changes between species, species like trout tend to be very slimy. Um, so like Monica said, we, we split how we were gonna tackle the different fish we covered today and keep in mind, there's so many other types of fish that we won't talk about today, um, but we split it by ecoregions, and these ecoregions are actually defined by something called the Nebraska Natural Legacy Project, um, which seeks to kind of identify um, areas that are specifically unique for their, the, the animals that live there or the type of habitat that you can find there. And um, this project works to conserve the habitat, plants, animals that can be found in these specific areas. And it also identifies certain species that might be um, more endangered or threatened. And um, so we, we wanted to use this as kind of our guide. And then just remind you too, that as you look across Nebraska, we've got our tall grass prairie moving mixed grass, sand hills to short grass. A lot of things change from the Eastern side of the state to the Western side. So um, where one side might be have a little more water you move to where there's less precipitation over the year. Um, so that can impact which fish you find there. And then, um, yeah, just keeping in mind too that there's different temperatures of water. So there's kind of warmer water, cool water, cold water. And Nebraska has a cool um, cold water stream, cool water streams plan that, that kind of talks more about this. But this also determines which fish live where. So um, with that, I am going to hand things back to Monica. Um, do you want me to stop sharing my screen here? Oh, uh, sure. Okay. Fine. All right, and then I will just share my screen. Maybe. All right. You still see the presenter view, don't you? Yep. Yes. <laughs> Hi, guys. There we go. Weird. Okay. 
Uh, so like Grace said, we're going to break it up into some different groups. Um, so I'm going to go ahead and start with a uh, tall grass prairie area. So we're going to actually move a little bit backwards, I guess, um, instead of like when you read, you know, you read uh, this way, we're going to actually go the other way. So we're going to start in the tall grass prairie area. So we're here in Lincoln, Nebraska right now. Um, so I'm going to be talking about uh, the area kind of over here, and then we're going to kind of move and end with a short grass prairie. All right, so when we talk about tall grass prairie, one of the major features of the tall grass prairie ecosystem is the Missouri River. Um, so the longest river, not by much, but the longest river in the United States um, looks a lot different. Um, if you ever talked about Lewis and Clark in school, um, or if you ever imagine the Missouri River when it was first uh, discovered or when it was first um, it was very different than it is now. Um, it has changed actually really dramatically. Um, there's a lot of dams now. There's a lot of levees to help with that flood control. Um, there's a lot of commercial navigation. Um, a lot of the times now, um, it's actually been made wider and, um, and just different because a lot of the barge and the transport that went on there um, historically and even still today. So um, it also gets a lot of agricultural use and there's a lot of hydropower um, generation that's going on in the Missouri as well. So with all those things going on, it couldn't necessarily look like it did um, 200 years ago. So it is very different, um, but there's still fish in there. Um, there's many species of fish that need those really long areas of undisturbed river to complete their life cycle. Um, so some of them have kind of changed and we might have different fish than there were 150, 200 years ago, um, but there are still fish there. Um, if you've ever heard of Gavin's Point Dam, um, this is one of the major, um, I don't want to use the word obstruction because that sounds bad, but it is a barrier that um, a lot of fish, um, it has changed a lot of the movement of the fish in the Missouri. So um, when we talk about the Missouri, there's about 15 characteristic fish species um, that uh, kind of stereotypical of the Missouri River. We obviously don't have time to talk about all 15 today, so I kind of picked some of my favorite ones and the ones that um, are kind of a little bit more interesting uh, to some of us. So I'm going to talk about the sturgeon family. This is one of my personal favorite fish. Um, I do have to admit that when I was in, in school, I was a fisheries and wildlife major, and I would always tell people that I was just a wildlife major because I really wasn't into fish, but sturgeon are actually what made me um, appreciate them more and uh, really get into fish. So um, if you've ever looked at a sturgeon, whether it's a lake sturgeon, a pallid sturgeon, or a shovel nose sturgeon, they're very primitive looking. They almost look like living fossils. Uh, there's a lot of fish actually that do that. Um, but even some of the fossil records are known to predate those dinosaurs. So a lot of us think that when the dinosaurs, that was a long time ago, and well, yes, it was, there was a lot of stuff before them as well. So even some of our sturgeon, um, they were there long before the dinosaurs and they really have not changed a lot since that time. Um, their skeleton is mo mostly that cartilaginous um, feeling. So the same thing as your nose and your ears, it's very flexible, um, yet it is still a little, a little hard as well. Uh, if you've ever touched a sturgeon or looked at one, they look like they have really bony armor and plates on them. A lot of the times if you ever handle them, you have to wear gloves because um, they're, they're very hard and they can and prick you and they, um, they can draw blood as well. So um, their intestines are very primitive as well. They have what's called a spiral shape in their intestines. Um, they're not very long and so that food is forced to follow in a spiral shape. It's similar to a shark um, when they digest their food. Their mouth, they do have a jaw, um, Sorry, they do not, they do have jaws, um, but they have a sucker shaped mouth as well. So you can see in that picture there, um, they kind of float along the bottom and then they suck up that substrate and the food that they're eating. And then they will expel that through their real, their gill rakers um, to get all that extra stuff out of there that they don't want. Um, in this photo, you might notice they have four little, what they look like little strings um, that are on the bottom of their mouth there. Um, those are called barbels. So these are, um, sensors to help them find their food. Um, and it's also a good way to identify two of our sturgeon that look very, very similar to each other. All right, so when we talk about native sturgeon to Nebraska, we have three of them. Uh, we have something called the pallid sturgeon. We have a shovel nose sturgeon and we have a lake sturgeon. 
All right, so our lake sturgeon, these are going to be the largest sturgeon that are found in Nebraska. They're very heavy bodied animals. Um, this is a great picture of them here. The one in this guy's hand is obviously very cute and very tiny, uh, but they get a lot bigger than that. Uh, they definitely have a little bit more of a, a conical or a cone shaped mouth than the other ones do. It's not as long as a shovel nose or a pallid, and they're really heavy bodied kind of a torpedo shaped when they get a little bit older. Um, they have been recorded in Nebraska in the Platte Rivers, Missouri River and some of the lower reaches of the Elkhorn. They're not found extremely often. Um, I remember the last few years that uh, fisheries division did their pallid sturgeon broodstock collecting and um, there were a couple times that they did actually find one and that was very big deal. It was very cool to know that they found one. Uh, these guys prefer those really deep um, areas of larger rivers. So again, Elkhorn, Platte, Missouri, uh, rivers where they can um, use except for when they spawn. Uh, one thing that I found super interesting is that uh, females, they do not reach sexual maturity until they're about 24 to 26 years old. That's a really long time for a fish um, just for those females. And then the males, they don't reach sexual maturity until they're about 15. So these can be extremely long lived fish. Um, some of them have been recorded weighing over 300 pounds. Those are over 100 years old. So again, that living fossil, that living dinosaur. Uh, they eat a lot of insects and invertebrates, uh, small crustaceans. And like what they will do is, like I said, they will um, drag their uh, mouths on the ground. They will suck in a bunch of food and some of that dirt or uh, gravel, substrate, whatever's on the floor. And they um, use it to filter out uh, their food and then they expel the rest of the stuff that they do not want. Um, and then in Nebraska, these guys are also listed as a state endangered species. So again, we just don't see them very often. All right, to um, kind of contrast with that, we have something called a pallid sturgeon. This is my favorite fish, uh, by the way, if anyone wants to know. Uh, these guys are very light gray in color. They're almost a whitish. Um, they're very pretty. Um, and then they have this elongated, almost a humpback shaped form on them. And then their barbels are going to be a little different than the ones I'm going to talk about next, the shovel nose sturgeon. But these guys, when you look at them, they're arranged in a curve pattern, almost like a little rainbow at the bottom of their mouth. Um, these guys have been captured in the Missouri, um, all the way from the South Dakota border to the Kansas border. So any way in that stretch between the Missouri, they um, have somehow been recorded. Um, but the Platte River and Elkhorn Rivers are ones that they're very common in. Uh, prefer highly turbid waters. Uh, so when we talk about turbidity, that mostly just means how clear the water is. Um, so they like pretty much muddy, not clear water. And the Missouri is a great place for that. Um, females will spawn when, again, when they're about 15 years old. So again, very long lived fish. Um, and then most of the pallids that we see in Nebraska, the wild caught ones, um, they're very small. They're usually less than 10 pounds. There are larger ones out there, but um, commonly they just don't get a lot bigger than that, the ones that we're finding. Um, and then young pallids will feed again on aquatic insects, invertebrates, um, and then they will actually switch their food sources when they get a little bit older um, and they will start eating other fish. Uh, so in Nebraska, these guys are listed as a federal and state listed endangered species. So they are on the federal endangered list. All right, I do have to show you this picture. This is Grace and I. We've both done uh, the pallid broodstock collection here at Game and Parks. Um, I had done it um, up to these last couple years for eight years. I'm not sure how long Grace has been doing it, but it was one of our, both of our favorite things. We love doing it. So this is both of us with a pallid sturgeon. Um, I think, I don't know, Grace's, mine was on the Missouri. I'm not sure where Grace's was, but um, we've both done it. We loved it, so. All right, and then our last uh, sturgeon that I'm gonna talk about is the shovel nose sturgeon. So um, shovel nose and pallids, when you look at them and if you're not really sure what you're looking at, they can look very similar to each other. Um, shovel nose sturgeons are gonna be usually a little darker in color, maybe a tan, brownish, pinkish color, um, but they can actually hybridize together. Um, and I've seen them a couple of times and it's almost extremely hard to tell, um, is this a shovel nose, is this a pallid because they have features of both. Um, but again, they have that elongated shape. They have their barbels, um, those little stringy things on their mouth. They go in a straight line instead of that curved rainbow shape like the pallid sturgeon. 
And I'll show you here a picture of what that actually looks like. Uh, these guys are native to larger rivers. Again, Missouri, Lower Platte, Lower Elkhorn. Um, they used to actually be found all the way west to Casper, Wyoming. Um, but with changes and um, just environmental changes, changes in the river, they are usually not found um, any west of Columbus, Nebraska now. They mostly are kind of in that eastern portion. Um, these guys are found in channels near sandbars, usually greater than three feet. They like the little bit of depth um, around gravel and kind of rocky areas. And they are one of the smallest um, native sturgeon, only reaching about five pounds. So again, they can be bigger. I've seen large ones, but they don't get much more than that normally. They eat invertebrate larvae and then small midge larvae and fly, midfly larvae. Um, so these guys are not an endangered or a uh, federally state listed species at all. All right, really quick, here's the difference between them. The pallid one is gonna be on the left and the shovel nose is on the right. It's a little harder to distinguish that pallid, but you can tell that the two inner barbels are a little shorter and they're almost in a curved pattern. Um, the shovel nose then on the right is gonna have them in a straight line and they're all pretty much the same uh, size. They're gonna be a little bit bigger. All right, bow fins. These guys I thought were super interesting. Um, they're again, a very old or primitive fish. Um, they have a very elongated body um, and they have very long um, um, dorsal fins as well. Um, the body is covered in those cycloid scales that um, Grace mentioned earlier. earlier. Um, they just overlap and then they allow for greater flexibility of that animal to move. And these guys also have tons of teeth. They're very voracious animals, um, good predators. They have been recorded in places like the Platte, the Elkhorn, and the Missouri River. And then um, they've also been imported with other fish species to Nebraska. So um, they, it's sometimes been an accidental introduction um, or or not, but it's inadvertent a lot of the times. Uh, they follow, or they're a lot of times found in shallow lakes in the backwaters of our rivers. Um, and then most of the time their spawning will occur in the springtime. Um, one thing that I thought really neat is the males will build a nest. Uh, so they actually will clear all the weeds out of an area and they form a little trough um, where the female was then attracted to spawn. Um, the male then will defend the nest um, until the fish are around two months old. And if you guys look at this picture, you will notice that there's a little eye spot near their caudal fin or their tail fin. Um, scientists think there's probably two reasons why they have this. One of them is to be a little bit more distracting if a predator um, bites them it's they're more likely to survive if they bite the tail than the head. Um, but another reason is they think that the males who um, when they build their nest and kind of help their young, they will actually, um, it's a homing mechanism so that they shepherd all their little fishes in and then those uh, little tiny fish are able to find them and keep understanding of where they are. Um, and then these guys are carnivores. They eat fish, amphibians, crayfish, leeches, aquatic insects. These guys will also breathe air by gulping at the surface when the temperatures are above about 50 degrees. So this helps them live in really low oxygenated areas where other fish just might not be able to survive. It's again, that really primitive um, adaptation for them. And they can also dig themselves into the moist substrate um, when there is a dry period. So again, it helps them to survive in areas where other fish might not be able to. All right, American eel. Um, these guys are not found a lot uh, anymore. They used to be very common around the Omaha area, but we just don't see them much, but you, they might surprise an angler every once in a while. Um, they are fish. They're very elongated snake looking fish. They have a single gill opening on the sides of their head. They have no pelvic fins, dorsal fins, caudal fins, anal fins form a single middle line as you guys see in this photo here. And then the scales are gonna be actually embedded into their skin. Like I said, they're not found very frequently anymore, but they have been recorded near uh, Gavin's Point Dam, the Loop River, and the Platte River as well. Uh, these guys are going to be, uh, and please don't laugh at me if I say this wrong, uh, catadromous, which means that they um, they are born in salt water. They come to, or they move to an area that is freshwater when they are an adult, and then they will actually go back to the salt water area to spawn. Uh, they can get fairly long, about 60 inches, and they are predators of a lot of different types of species, um, suckers, catfish, minnows. Um, these guys, like I said, very common around the Omaha area before it was dammed. And then we just don't simply see them much anymore. Um, but again, they still can surprise an angler if that water source that they are uh, fishing at has a direct access to the sea. All right. 
next area we're going to move a little bit farther west and this is going to be our mixed grass prairie region so it was almost kind of hard to find some fish that were strictly in this area they might be a little farther west they might be a little farther east as well um, so you could find a couple of these fish in two different types of ecoregions all right, so when we talk about the mixed grass prairie, um, there's going to be streams and rivers, not necessarily huge bodied rivers like the Missouri, um, but there are going to be some other ones as well, too. Uh, a lot of these fish can be generalists. They can survive in lots of different types of areas. And then most of these regions are going to have a little bit smaller fish, uh, not necessarily huge fish like sturgeon or paddlefish in this area. Um, and then all of these areas, the um, biologically unique landscapes, these are things like the lower Niobrara, the middle Niobrara, the rainwater basin. So there's still huge, very large areas um, and common areas within this mixed grass prairie. All right, so something that can be found in this area is called the Johnny Darter, um, which is kind of a fun name to say. Um, if you know anything about darters, uh, they get their name because they're very quick. They dart into out of places. Uh, they're very slender fish. They're usually straw colored and they have a very blunt snout. Um, so it's not very pointy like a sturgeon was. Um, when breeding season happens, the males will have nearly a full black head on them. Um, and then they also have a squarish caudal fin. If you guys remember earlier, Grace talked a lot about we're gonna be using those words and you'll notice lots of different sizes and shapes of them. This is one that doesn't have a pointy caudal fin, but said it has more of a squarish one. Uh, these guys are more abundant in the eastern third of the state, the Nemaha, Lower Platte River, Elkhorn Rivers, and then uh, prior, maybe because we've done more sampling or we just know about them more, we didn't see a ton of them before the 1970s. Um, it was fairly uncommon, but now we see quite a bit of them. They're very abundant in places like creeks, um, but also can be found in places like rivers and shorelines of creeks. But they're very uncommon in fast moving areas. They need kind of that slower water. And then these guys will spawn pretty much anywhere where their eggs can attach. Uh, so this is gonna be places like the undersides of rocks and logs and um, even just materials that are in the water where they can uh, have their eggs attached to them. We call it egg clustering. Um, they're the only subgenus in Nebraska that will actually do this. And then these guys, the, the darter name, they get really fast. They are sight feeders. So they go off of their eyesight to find their food, um, which a lot of the time is gonna be those aquatic invertebrates. And a lot of the time that's gonna be larva. And then in Nebraska, these guys are gonna be considered what we call a tier two species um, in that natural legacy guide that Grace mentioned earlier, which basically just means this is a species uh, at risk in Nebraska. So um, not endangered, not threatened, but just at risk. We need to watch where it's going to head. All right. Uh, tadpole Mad Tom. This is a fun name to say. Um, this little guy is found in uh, that mixed grass prairie region as well. They're going to be a chubby fish. They're going to have a rounded caudal fin instead of a square one or a pointy one. And they have a very dark brown, kind of a black belly. Um, sorry, on their back, but then on their belly, it's going to be a little bit darker. So Grace talked about that lateral line. Um, a lot of fish that have lighter bellies and darker skin on top, that's a camouflage reason. That's going to help them protect themselves from predators a lot of the time. Uh, these guys are pretty abundant in Nebraska. They're going to be found um, in really large quantities in the upper Big Blue River. And then they like pretty moderately turbid, so not super muddy waters, but not super clear either, and then slow moving streams. Uh, they also like a lot of dense aquatic vegetation to hide in um, and to also find their food. And then these guys, both parents will guard the young. Um, so they don't get very large, about three inches as an adult, and that is considered a large individual. And they eat a lot of midge fly larvae, isopods, and then the young will eat things like zooplankton. And then um, as they get older, they can eat other fish like minnows as well. And in Nebraska, these guys are also a species at risk. So that tier two species again. All right, last one for this area, and then I will let Grace take it on. Um, it's called the orange throat darter. So these guys are extremely pretty uh, during their mating season. The males are gonna be, um, this brightly colored illustration here is not a, an exaggeration by any means. So when uh, males will um, spawn, and mate and breeding season in the winter time, they will look like this. So they're very pretty, brightly colored um, during that breeding season. Females are gonna be drab and boring and kind of a not bright color. Um, that's a lot of the times due to they need to protect 
their eggs or they just simply don't want to get eaten. Um, they have a very stout appearance and they also have that squarish caudal fin again. Um, they're mostly found in the Platte River and they have very small populations within the sand hills as well. Um, their habitat and reproduction, they like small streams near the headwaters and especially in sandy and gravel soil. Adults will eat caddisflies, insects, and other fish eggs. And again, these guys are going to be a tier two species, so a species at risk in Nebraska. Um, there's a lot of confusion sometimes when people talk about orange throat darters because there's a lot of different subspecies. Uh, the one that we have in Nebraska is called the Plains orange throat darter, um, but there are other subspecies throughout the um, United States as well. All right, so with that, I'm gonna stop sharing my screen and give it back to Grace. Great, and actually before we continue, we had a few, a rush of questions right before you and, um, ended. So um, Daryl, this one might be for you. Do the mad toms have spines like catfish? I might, I'll ask to unmute you, there you go. Um, absolutely, mad toms are me members of the catfish family and they have spines, you know, one spine in each of the pectoral fins and in the dorsal spin or dorsal fin. Um, very sharp, very pointy, and hurt a lot if you get by them. Perfect. Yeah, so we'll have to watch out for those. Um, and then how many eggs can the different kinds of fish lay was one question. Um, um, yeah, go ahead. Sorry. Fecundity is a big word that describes the number of eggs that the fish will deposit. And that depends on the species, different species of fish lay more eggs than others, but certainly there are some species that lay hundreds of thousands of eggs per female. Um, some of them maybe even more than that. So um, it, just in general, fish have lots of eggs, produce a lot of offspring because the mortality rates are very high on a little fish that's only fractions of an inch long. Perfect. And then um, the last one was, why do fish die so quickly in the sun? They got to be in the water. <laughs> their, their gills have to have water in order to take in oxygen. So when they're out of the water, and again, that varies a little bit from one species to another, um, but they all need water. They've got to have water. Perfect. All right, I'm going to move us ahead here. All right, can you see the correct view, Monica? All right, so I'll zoom back through here. All right, we're gonna talk about the Sand Hills Prairie ecoregion. And um, as you can see, this is more kind of centrally north um, Nebraska located. Um, it encompasses rivers like the Loop Rivers and the Niobrara, um, at least sections of the Niobrara. And this is a really interesting ecoregion. Um, it was kind of developed by gr glaciers that were moving out, you know, um, they were evaporating and, and melting. And so as they disappeared, loose sand was left behind that was then blown into sand dunes. And today this area is the largest stabilized dune system in uh, the Western hemisphere of the world. And one of the largest intact grasslands in North America. So if you think about it, um, there's not a lot of places left that, that are of such large area. Um, so this, this ecoregion is really unique to Nebraska specifically. And um, if you have never been there, it is really awesome to see. So, um, and beneath the sand hills actually lies our Ogallala Aquifer. <clears throat> and so the water table here sits very close to the, to where um, it meets the land. And so um, many shallow lakes are formed because water might upwell from that aquifer and create small shallow lakes. So it just picture that kind of as you think about these species that we'll talk about that live in the Sandhills ecoregion. Um, so the first one we're going to talk about is the grass pickerel. And it is a subspecies of the redfin pickerel, but um, if you're familiar with those, but the redfin pickerel is not actually found in Nebraska. So if you catch a smaller looking um, species that's kind of from the pike family, uh, this is likely what you're looking at. So a grass, grass pickerel. And they have a duck-like snout, very similar to things like um, northern pike and muskie. 
Um, and they, but they are the smallest of these. They might only get to around an average of six inches long. So um, they're not, not super large, um, but they, so like I said, they, these also are, have an interesting distribution in Nebraska. Um, they kind of have a larger population size for, for Nebraska and it's fairly disconnected from its traditional range of habitat, which is from like the Appalachian Mountains to the Great Lakes down to Eastern Texas. So um, this fish, definitely it's kind of an, an unique one um, and not one that you might see too often, but um, it prefers uh, slower moving streams that are, are heavily vegetated. So lots of weeds growing in it, um, backwaters associated with maybe some of those rivers and then beaver ponds as well that you know are created by beavers creating dams. So um, they also, as they, as they prefer that vegetation, they also prefer it for uh, their adhesive eggs. So they'll lay their eggs, which are kind of sticky and they'll stick onto the vegetation and they do not protect their eggs. They just lay them and they leave them. And um, it's kind of who gets lucky will survive. So, and then an interesting thing is females grow faster and live a little bit longer than males generally do of this species. And then um, if you have experienced anything with Northern pike or muskie, they're a pretty aggressive fish. And so this fish, it kind of follows along with that. It's an ambush predator. And so it will, you know, strike quickly um, towards any sort of larger fish like sunfish. Um, that, that'd be like bluegill, bass, um, or, or crayfish. So um, an interesting thing that I, I thought was really cool associated with that lateral line again uh, for the grass pickerel is that it has um, four pores in its jaw on each side that are interconnected with the lateral line on its body, um, which just allows for greater sensitivity to pressure changes in the water. So if you think about it, this really makes sense for them because they are a predatory fish. So um, this allows them to catch things even more successfully. So our next fish is actually going to be um, one that's pretty different from that one. So this is called the fine scale dace. And um, that word dace is actually, it can originate from um, a French word that actually means darter or to dart. So um, like Monica was talking about the Johnny darter, this, this species, these minnow species are also very um, prone to dart through the water. So uh, when you see that, there's kind of multiple that have dace, you'll see in the next one also has that in its name. So they only get to be about three to five inches and really you, you cannot hardly see their scales without some sort of magnification. So they're very small, but they would be those cycloid scales like we talked about. Um, and they really like headwater tributaries of the Niobrara River and the Loop Rivers. And an interesting thing too, is that they are a glacial relict species. So what this means is that they would have been far more common in Nebraska um, years and years ago when we had glaciers receding um, and they were just to the north of our, our Nebraskan border. So, um, and the reason that they prefer these spring headwaters is because they're cold and very much like what Nebraska used to have when the glaciers were around. So um, they, they also prefer there not to be any predatory sport fishes around because obviously they're pretty easy prey. So if there's, you're less likely to find them in those areas. Um, and their fry are the first to appear in the spring or one of the first. So they're probably the early food source for anything that is living in those, those spring headwaters. Um, as young, they feed on zooplankton and then they will become more predaceous actually as they grow and will eat small invertebrates um, like insects and snails. And so like Monica mentioned too about some of the other species, they have very specific habitat requirements in Nebraska and they have a limited range of where they can go because in the sandhills, a lot of that water is only located in one place. So um, this makes them a state threatened species in Nebraska only. Um, Another uh, species that's similar is the northern red belly dace. This is also a state threatened species in Nebraska. And as you can see, it's um, a little bit more colorful, but um, it, it is one of the more colorful native fish that we have in Nebraska. And it's a small little minnow. Again, it has very small cycloid scales, will be hard to see without any type of magnification and will only likely get to be around three inches in length. Um, this is also a glacial relic species. So they prefer, again, those cold spring headwater areas in creeks and um, they, they just like that colder water, um, especially with spring fed creeks or ponds. 
And then they, they also do like vegetation a little more. Some are, some prefer that more or less. The Northern red belly dace likes some vegetation for laying their eggs on. And then the young, young will feed on algae and zooplankton and then adults become more particulate feeders. So they like a wide variety of algae and small invertebrates. Um, and I know we've said invertebrates a lot. So for some of our younger listeners, that's like different insects, like maybe mosquito larva or um, like dragonfly larva that will actually live underwater where they are. So these species um, are like the Northern red belly dace and the fine scale dace. They're both smaller, um, less likely that you're gonna see them, um, but why are they important? It's always important to think about our food chain and how everything connects together. And so um, obviously we don't want them all to get eaten, but they are an important source in the food chain for other species. So um, some really cool smaller, smaller fish species. And another one is the black nose shiner. This one is a state endangered species. So while it might be more common in other states surrounding us because of that glacier receding, kind of leaving them stranded in the sand hills, um, they have a very specific habitat they need and it's very sensitive to changes. So they're unique because they have a black line that runs all the way around through their eye, around the front of their nose, all the way to the back of their tail. And um, that black line is kind of made up of these crescent shaped um, markings all along down the scales. And so that's just a good identifier. If you ever find some minnow species, you might have found a black nose shiner if you if you see those marks on it. Um, so it does like the Niobrara River in the north central region of Nebraska. That may be where you're likely to find it. And then um, it, it prefers uh, pools and clear streams, hard substrates on the bottom, you know, like gravel, and then some medium vegetation, not a lot. Um, this species, like we said, is very sensitive to poor water quality and um, its reproduction behavior isn't well known. So, but it does enjoy feeding along the bottom, um, eating algae and insects. And so um, just a good thing to remember is any sign of this species indicates extremely good water quality. And they have been eliminated from many areas already just because of um, you know, water being diverted to other places, channelization of, of different streams, um, and then things like Monica was talking about with turbidity, um, some of that sandy um, or silt getting into, into areas that are their habitat. And then the last species we're going to talk about for um, the Sand Hills ecoregion is the brook stickleback, which I thought was a fascinating fish. Um, as you can kind of see in the picture or from the, the illustration we've included, they've got kind of these um, spines on their back. So those minnows we were just looking at, those were soft rayed fishes. So they have softer fins and not that spine like Daryl was talking about in the mad tom or the catfish. Um, a brook stickleback has spines in, in the, some of its like dorsal area and in the fin. So um, that makes it pretty unique. And it's, it's a body appears to have no scales, but it actually does have these weak bony plates located on it. And then like we were talking about with the, where the caudal fin attaches to the peduncle, you can see it gets very narrow. So that's something that makes it kind of unique. Um, and the greatest abundance of this species is in the sand hills. So it's very specific to this area. It likes slow moving marsh streams, very heavily vegetated. And the males will actually build a nest out of the vegetation, even rooted vegetation, and make kind of like this ball. And then he'll coax the female to go into that ball of vegetation and lay her eggs. And then she has to like, she gets trapped in there and she has to find a way to escape. Um, and so then he'll patch up the hole where she leaves after she lays around 200 eggs. And then if he's able to, he'll even try to get other females to come in and, and do this if he can get it to happen more than once. And so then uh, once the eggs start to hatch, he'll defend them, he'll defend the young and he'll even herd them back into this vegetative nest um, until eventually it's too much work and then sometimes he'll even just eat them. <laughs> so um, he's got, this species is a really interesting one. And um, so they spend a lot of time but protecting their young, which is unique for, for most of our fish species. Um, so like I said, they might eat young fish or insect larvae or crustaceans, worms, even other fish eggs. And then a unique thing other than this fish is very unique looking is that it's very tolerant of low oxygen levels and water. So it could maybe live in somewhere that um, does not have a lot of dissolved oxygen in there, in the water. All right, last, last ecoregion, 
for the, our presentation today is the Shortgrass Prairie ecoregion. And so this is the very western edge of Nebraska, um, encompasses a lot of like the North Platte River and um, kind of like the Ogallala area, lakes and white, I think the White Creek, but I'm remembering right or wrong. Um, and so, or sorry, the White River, that's what it is. So this, this area or ecoregion is comprised of pine woodlands, um, badlands type scenery, and then other vegetation types. So even aside from short grass, there are some other things going on in this ecoregion. And um, it's like I said, you've got the North Platte River and then lots of wet meadows and streams that are colder in temperature. And then um, smaller rivers to the northwest, which is what the white where the White River is, and then um, ephemeral streams are common here, which is a type of stream that is not always flowing. So sometimes in dry periods, they won't be existing there. So uh, we've got a few more here. The long-nosed dace, I think they're a really cool looking fish. They've got a really fleshy snout, kind of reminds me of like a taper or some other type of animal that has a really fleshy snout. Um, so you can kind of see that in the illustration, but you can also see in the picture, the colorations kind of differ. And so guidebooks will sometimes show you the brightest colors a fish will have while pictures sometimes capture them when they're a little less brightly colored. So they have very small scales and uh, like I said, a fleshy snout. And then um, they have one of the widest distributions of all North American minnows. Um, but in Nebraska, they kind of are really centrally in the Platte and Niobrara rivers and, and Lodgepole Creek. So they like those streams that are small to medium size with moderate to swift currents. They like, they like that water flow and their eggs are released into gravel at the bottom of the stream. And um, usually the young will hatch down there and kind of stay down in the rocks until they are, grow and eat. So they'll eat on all those aquatic insects that are down there in the rocks with them um, until eventually they, they gain those muscles to swim a little bit better in currents. But they are most strongly associated with swift currents and riffles. So that makes them even as a smaller species pretty unique because they like that swifter flowing water. So I couldn't talk about this ego region without talking about a trout. So trout are not, it's important to know that basically trout are not native to Nebraska. They were introduced, um, but uh, you can find them there. And so I thought this would be a good one of the species to highlight. So there's rainbow trout, cutthroat, brook, and then we have brown trout that I'm gonna talk about here. So they have a yellowish body color with black, brown, red spots, usually surrounded by a halo of a lighter color. And then they do have um, small teeth and then even their tongue actually has barbs on it. And, and they, this is a fish that, that is very predatory and will hunt by sight. And so that barb tongue actually kind of helps them grab some of those, those prey items that they might eat. So insects, crayfish, um, even things like salamanders and frogs and even rodents. So um, this is definitely more of a predatory fish. And um, so they were introduced to Nebraska around 1914. They're actually native to Europe and Western Asia and they prefer cold water tributaries to the North Platte River. So if you're ever looking for some, that's kind of the areas that you might find them. Um, a lot of those streams tend to be like private streams and, um, but they are a really cool habitat for, for trout as well. Um, so like I said, they prefer clear, cold, clean streams, 65 to 75 degrees, um, which is, is about as warm as they can tolerate. And then females will actually create what's called a red. And so they'll take their tail and dig or excavate um, a depression in the bottom of, of a river. And that will be called a red. And this is where they lay their eggs. And then once they're fertilized, she'll kind of move some gravel back over them. And the eggs will actually incubate over winter and then hatch in the spring. So um, the biggest fish that was caught of this species in Nebraska is actually was actually 20 pounds. So um, they can get fairly large once, once they get the right habitat conditions and lots of food. Another long nose one, but this is called the long nose sucker. And so it is actually, um, it prefers cooler water than most Nebraskan suckers that we have here in our state. Um, their scales are again small, the mouth is located underneath um, the long snout. So much like you would expect for a sucker, it kind of has those mouth parts that can kind of drop down. 
And then the sides of the male can be a reddish color during breeding season. So they're found in cooler water, cool streams. Um, spawning has been observed in streams, but then they'll also have been seen in, uh, near lake shores like in Ogallala, Lake Ogallala. And then um, they'll scrape invertebrates from the rock and gravel at the bottom of a, of a that stream that they're inhabiting. And so the largest fish of this species that's been caught in Nebraska was only two pounds. So it just kind of shows you how different species will, they have size limits. They'll, they'll get certain size and then they won't get much bigger. So, and our final species is called the Creek Chub uh, that we chose to talk about today. And this species is actually pretty widespread across Nebraska. Um, but it is one that is found again in this western um, short grass prairie ecoregion. And so it has medium sized scales. Sometimes it can even from that illustration you can see it, it will even have like pinkish colored scales. Um, it might have a flap of skin near the mouth. So if you were having trouble identifying it, sometimes that will be helpful. And then the more of like a tube like body. So um, they, they prefer creeks with gravel substrate. So um, and males will actually dig so it's back to a male is creating this nest, um, digging into the gravel, a pit that, and then he attracts the female to lay her eggs into that, um, and then will bury them after he fertilizes them. So, and then he'll actually continue to dig other pits to try to uh, attract um, other females as well. And then sometimes they'll even let other minnow species spawn over top of their cleared gravel area. And so this is kind of makes them interesting because this species can be responsible for creating some of the only suitable habitat for maybe some of those other minnow species because they clean, they kind of clean up an area and then minnow species prefer that for their eggs as well. So kind of a cool way that there's some um, symbiosis going on there where they're kind of helping each other out. And then these adults are pretty, they can be pretty predatory. They're, they obviously, they don't get humongous, but this fish is a smaller predatory fish that can be found in a lot of our our creeks and streams in Nebraska. So with that, Monica, I hope I didn't go too long. <laughs> um, we, I just wanted to show you again one more time, this resource was really helpful for us. And so I wanted to make sure we put that back up there and then um, leave room for any questions because I know we went over a lot of things or Monica, let me know if there are some. Uh, Daryl's done a really good job at answering them. We did have one and he might be working on this now. Uh, someone asked, how big do long nose suckers usually get? I just looked at our um, state records. Our rod and reel state record for long nose sucker is two pounds, seven ounces. Right. So, so not very big. Not re re real big, <laughs> no. Yeah, probably around like five inches or something, probably. Oh, you know, 12 inches would probably be the average. If you got one that's a pound or better, that's a big long nose sucker for Nebraska. Daryl, would those be one of those fish that would be considered like a micro fish or are those even too big for well, micro fishing? You know, <laughs> that might depend on who you would ask. I, it, it's bigger than what most guys are catching when they are quote micro fishing. But the whole, I love the microfishing thing because the whole idea is to catch some of those unusual species that anglers usually don't fish for. And certainly long no sucker would be one of those. So, you know, maybe put it on the upper end of the microfishing, um, but still a cool fish, something a little unusual, a great example of the diversity we have in the state. All right. Well, if you guys have any questions, please go ahead and put them in the chat. Um, uh, Daryl did a great job of answering stuff as they came in, so we don't have a lot of extra questions here at the end. But um, I do want to remind everybody that we did record this. And if so, if you have a friend that didn't get to make it or would want to watch it again for some more information that you missed, we will be putting it on our Game and Parks online education page. Um, I will go ahead and type that where you can find it in the chat. It's just outdoornebraska.gov. Um, slash online education. And then when you look for it, it's under the nature videos tab. Uh, you can find all of that science of series that we have, um, all of them from previous season and this season as well. Uh, someone did ask, um, can you touch on paddlefish by any chance? Uh, namely curious about their conservation in the state and their niche in the ecosystem. Um. 
Well, they're they're only present in the Missouri River in Nebraska, or that's primarily where they're present. Uh, we keep very close tabs on paddlefish in the Missouri River. Um, that's one of the things our research crew does on the Missouri River is keep close tabs, of course, on pallid sturgeon and paddlefish. So uh, we do have a harvest season on paddlefish, but it's closely regulated. Um, there's only a certain quota of paddlefish that are allowed to be harvested be, because we have a limited resource there. Um, they're still healthy. The population's still doing well. Of course, there's threats like um, you know the dams and channelization that's occurred over the years, um, threats from invasive species, um, but they're still doing uh, well right now. Their niche in the ecosystem, uh, they're a, a filter feeder. Um, they literally swim around with their big mouth open and filter plankton out of the water. So they feed at the very bottom of the aquatic food chain. Um, so, you know, it's very important that we have clean water and a healthy ecosystem or, or else species like paddlefish will be one of the first ones um, that'll be affected when things aren't going so well. Um, and then we had one other person ask, um, oh, Grace answered it. How large can um, creek chubs get? And she, she answered about five to 12 inches long. So. Yep, our, our state record hook and line creek chub was 11 ounces, about 12 inches long. So wow, that, that, 11 ounces, <laughs> that's tiny. They're a, very, they're a lot of fun to catch. They're very aggressive. So you can catch creek chubs on a lot of creeks in the state. And if you get one that's 10 inches or so, that's a big creek chub. And then one more question looks like, do we have alligator gar in Nebraska? Not in Nebraska. We have long nose gar, short nose gar, but the alligator gar are a southern species. Um, they do not survive in our waters. Right. Yeah, someone asked about the paddlefish. I really wanted to include them with our uh, big river fish. We just we just kind of ran out of time. So um, there's a ton, and I'm sure Daryl and Grace would agree on this. There's a ton of fish that we really wanted to talk about, but we just simply didn't have that time within this hour. Um, we could spend a whole a uh, whole series talking about just the river fish or just the mixed grass prairie or just any of these areas. So um, that yes. might possibly lead into a uh, Nebraska fish too. So talking about some things that we just didn't get a touch on today. So, um, but yeah. I thank you for everybody. Um, we're kind of running past our time here, um, just about exactly at uh, four o'clock. So uh, like I said, again, if you guys didn't get a chance to view this today or know someone that would like to view it again, um, it will be online, probably give us by noon tomorrow and it should be online for all of you guys to view as well. So um, otherwise, thank you everyone for joining us. We really appreciate this. Um, thank you again to Daryl um, and Grace for joining me today. This was Kind of thing that I did, but I, I loved having some co-hosts and some other people on it. It was fun today. So thank you guys. I hope you learned a lot. Um, if you again, if any questions, please go ahead and email us. And um, if we can't answer them, we will find someone that can. So thank you. And uh, we'll, we're, we're out. So thank you guys. Thank you. See ya.